So, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm before lunch, so maybe I'll still uh, keep you awake, hopefully. Uh, my role in Teva in the last four and a half, five years, I'm what is called the global CIO, Chief Information Officer, which is mostly about technology, but uh, I would say in the last two years, I was chartered by the company to try and understand what the heck are we going to do with this digital world which is coming on pharma companies. So I'm going to try and give you the perspective that we see from a pharma company perspective, which is uh, Teva, with the uniqueness that we think Teva has. So maybe, uh, first of all, the way we see the world, what are the macro trends that are actually happening in the health environment? I will relate quite a lot to the US market. Still, it is the biggest market in the world in terms of health. But a lot of things are pretty similar in terms of other markets as well. So we, we see three very, very big trends. And I will try to take these trends and from there to show with you how we envision our uh, way forward. Number one is cost. So I don't think I need to tell you what's going on with cost. I will show you some numbers. But actually cost is becoming, especially in the US, but not only, actually unbearable, not affordable for taking care uh, of health of people, especially because in the last uh, 50 years, longevity is, is much higher, people are healthier, live longer, and the burden, and I'll show you numbers on the burden, is actually becoming, in a way, impossible. The second element, which we do see, we call it consumerism. It's a difficult word to say, so I'll say it only once, but basically, the patient is more and more becoming conscious and becoming a consumer. I don't like to call a patient a consumer because a patient is a patient, but he's also a person, right? Not just a carrier of a disease. And he actually becomes more a decision, a decision maker and starts to behave as a consumer. And this is a big trend which I will show you. Third, this is an industry, you will see later on, that the health uh, overall is an industry that hasn't changed a lot in terms of its structural behavior in the last, I don't want to say 100 years because probably you will shoot me, but comparing to other industries, hasn't changed a lot. And we see very unusual players <coughs> coming into the game. If you ask today Teva, who do we fear in terms of competition, it's not necessarily the traditional pharma companies. It's not necessarily the traditional pharma companies. Okay? We feel potentially other players like big tech company, yeah, Google, Verily, if you know this uh, entity that was established in Google, or even retailers. So there is a disruption cooking up in the last I would say five to ten years in this environment, which we think may change the way this industry looks and behaves uh, dramatically. Costs. Actually, these are frightening numbers. So, cost in the US overall on health, and I will show you a breakdown, is around three trillion, with a T, not with a B, dollars which is around 70% of the GDP. You can see other countries. And out of the 8 billion overall, uh, two thirds is in you know, uh, advanced economies, 40% is the US. So this is actually becoming a phenomenal cost burden. And obviously, the future doesn't look brighter. Cost is going to increase. And the burden on the GDP is going to become more and more and more difficult. So this is about cost. If you look on the breakdown, this is an interesting picture. And we have a lot of data and analysis behind it. First of all, although pharma is strong on the news, everybody likes to beat us because we are expensive. Well, not ever because we are generic, but still. 
the cost or the part of the cost, the percentage of the pharmaceutical or the drugs out of the total cost is not the highest element. Actually, I think here it's even a little bit higher than it really is. It's between 8 to 15 percent. And obviously, the big cost element, which makes sense, are around care delivery, whether it's uh, hosp hospitals, physicians, etc. You could claim, because the adherence level on uh, consuming drugs is pretty low, especially if you talk about chronic patients, that if you can improve adherence, maybe you can improve the life situation of the patient and prevent additional burden of costs on the system, which is the health system. And if you look on the Pareto, which is not surprising, 5% polychronic, by the way, the size of the polychronic segment in the US, uh, well, it depends how you define whether it's five medication, 10 medication, but the average is between five to 10 medication per patient. Think about what does it mean to take 10 medications a day? You need a management system just to handle your life, which is one of the problems of these people. Uh, it's a huge segment in terms of number of people, 50 million, well, it depends how you define. It's a big segment. And not surprisingly, you can obviously see the Pareto, how this 5% uh, and then 20% of uh, chronic and at risk is creating the big burden from a cost perspective on the health system. And this is a problem because the system, when I say system, I mean the health system, cannot bear this cost anymore. And yet, we need to give people the opportunity uh, to treat themselves and improve their lives. So this is the cost element. Skip that. Uh, consumers. Two big shifts in consumers' life. First of all, more and more of health is becoming their expense, out of pocket. So patients, and again, it's the US, but not only the US, and even if we treat the US, it's still, I think, one third of the, something like that, of the global market, so we better <laughs> understand how it works. Uh, more and more, the patient becomes uh, more responsible for his health from a financial <coughs> point of view. It means that he becomes the decision maker more and more. That's why the trend towards consumerism. So it's no longer the passive patient that gets what he's being told, but the patient becomes somebody who is conscious and he starts to shop. And it's not only the millennials, guys. So different uh, segments in, in the population, starts to shop and have choices. And he becomes a stronger decision maker in the process of consuming, it's not a consuming, but yeah, yeah, consuming health. And that's a trend we see uh, in the world which will create some changes. On the other hand, if you are familiar with the uh, famous NPS, Net Promoter Score, this is a measure which I think was uh, created by Harvard. It's a famous measure, which is basically a loyalty measure, which ranges between minus 100 to 100. It's very, very, very well used. You can see, in terms of the loyalty and uh, willingness to consume uh, more services of the healthcare system, where does it stand comparing to other industry? In fact, the only one which is lower than us is banking, <laughs> which is not surprising. But still, it means that health as a whole, and pharma is, is obviously part of that, in terms of the loyalty. Now, what does it mean? It's extremely difficult to get convenient service. We call it the hustle man, right? It's not easy. When people are in need for help, it's the most vulnerable point in time. Oh, I need to go there, yeah, but I have to go. Okay. So I'll take the table with me, thank you. But it's difficult to consume health. The system is not built 
for their needs. The system is built the way the system is built, right? Understanding health is difficult. The time that you have with your doctor. So you can see, I'll, I'll do what I'm told, don't worry, for 10 minutes. I'll, so you can see two big trends in, on, on the consumer side. Number one, he's getting more responsibility because he's becoming more financially responsible. And on the other hand, consuming health from the system is becoming more and more complicated. Uh, information, people are looking for information. I don't remember the number. I think it was 100 trillion searches on health related item a year. 100 trillion search related items. Not all of them in Google, but in, 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 in this environment. So people are looking to learn more, to understand more. They want to be more conscious in what they do. And yet, as I said before, if you look on other industries that has transformed themselves in the last 20 years, retail is totally different, travel, I mean, there's no travel agencies anymore, and also banking and maybe, maybe others, yet healthcare basically has not changed fundamentally. And what I would like to share with you today, we believe it is on the verge of changing, changing and what uh, Teva uh, is expecting uh, to do there as a big player. The last point is technology. And we do see, uh, it's, it's, it's four dimensions if you want. I was trying to categorize it and then I will give some examples in a second. Technology is coming in as a potential disruptor in many, many, many ways. And again, I will try to give you, and I'm trying to give you our perspective, and I, I will show you in a second when I talk about Teva. But whether you talk about the retailers, and the retailers is an important touch point with the patient. You talk about big data, tech pharma, Google, genomics, Watson, I will say a few words on these guys. But they are doing things they didn't even dream to do five, and neither do we, five, ten years ago. Consumer markets, telehealth, and what we call uh, the full ecosystem. How do we treat populations? You know, population management, ACOs in the, in the US actually are trying to bring technology. You're familiar with ACOs, right? I mean, account. Uh, to bring technology to improve the way they actually manage the population they are responsible for, to make it much more proactive, real-time management of a patient condition, other than after the fact, protocol-based, which is a big difference. Just a few examples. Uh, virtual care. The problem with that, do you know what is the penetration in the US of virtual care in terms of visits, what's the percentage? Can somebody guess? 50%. 50%. More? Huh? Sorry, what, what is the penetration uh, of virtual doctor, virtual uh, visits out of the total visits in the US? Penetration rate? 10%. 10 50%? Yeah. Five. One. One. Point z point 0 0.5. Nothing. Half a percent. So the technology is there. It's pretty easy. It's extremely convenient. I mean, I don't know if you tried it, but it's not, it's not picking up. So I, I'm not, I don't want to try and go into the question why it's not picking up, but although the technology is here, some of the elements didn't pick up. But other players are, are changing the way they are going to uh, manage health. Also, Walmart. Do you know Walmart? You know that? Uh, the primary care visits you can do, 70 bucks, $4 for generic. 
Why are they doing it? Because any way as a patient today you, ex you spend this money before you even activate your insurance. So they said, okay, so let me give you a better service. If this is the case, you come in, you get a service, primary care, you buy your drugs, it's anyway your money. By the way, you also buy a, a toothpick and a, a toothbrush on the way out, but still it's a convenient service for the patient. Watson, just a few words. We do have a big partnership with Watson, so this is something I can uh, talk about. Uh, we, and I will show you that in a second. We have uh, taken a decision uh, to try and change some of the ways we interact with the world. Uh, we've signed a big partnership with Watson. There's a big promise there. We can talk about it two hours. I don't know if the promise will materialize or not, honestly but there are positive signs that this corpus of half a brain, it's not a full brain, let's not exaggerate, maybe can do something. And it's not only in diagnostics and other things which they play, it's not only in clinical prior matching which they play, also in our domain we think there is interesting potential with this, uh, I call it mass. And it's important, so, Five years ago, a pharma company uh, creating partnership with a <coughs> high-tech technology company for the sake of our business. It's not for the sake of our technology, but for the sake of our new business models, never thought of. Five years ago, right? We are pharma. We make drugs. We are drug dealers. Don't, don't. <laughs> Delete. Okay, uh, so Teva, with all this, a few words about Teva. Today, after the last uh, acquisition of Actavis, we are uh, one of the 10. We were not, but now we are among the 10 biggest. Uh, in generic, we are by far now uh, uh, the largest company. I will give you some other numbers later. We operate in uh, 80 markets, which, which is pretty big, sorry. Uh, 60,000 employee, revenue is not so updated, but uh, that's what we can pl publish at this point. So it's becoming a big gorilla, especially in the generic world, and that's why we think that if we make a move, we, we can have an impact. One of the things we have realized, we call this the chain link, not blockchain, chain link, that the are chains that some of it we see as our assets and some of it we will need to build or partner, that if we create a link between those chains, we can create something different <coughs> in the pharma industry, in the health industry. And the one simple different thing we want is to be able to create, and that's written at the heart of that, some direct relationship, meaningful relationship with the patients. Now when I say patients, I'll give you some numbers so you, understand, you will understand why it's a problem and why it's also maybe an opportunity. And the other element we understood, that there are many, many, many players in the market. Uh, technological players, uh, new health camera players, and there are many failures, and hopefully we will not fail, but there are many, many failures. And one of the things we understood, when you're trying to solve a person's problem in a holistic way, you have to address it holistically. So if the only thing you'll solve for him is, oh, wearables are a bad example, is that you'll prevent him from going to the pharmacy and you'll do direct shipment, which, by the way, why isn't... I mean, why to go to the pharmacy? Why to go to the pharmacy today? And by the way, if you want to consult with a pharmacist, you can do it through teleconsultation. I mean, it's not a problem. And it's not yet there. It will come, we believe. So, but if you solve only one dimension, it's not enough. Because if you look on, for example, the polychronics, <coughs> their life situation is more complicated than just going to the pharmacy. Right? They take 10 medications, 
They get it probably from five different doctors with five different prescriptions, and then you need a computer system just to manage the 10 medications they have to take every day and which one is which, and did I take the red one, the blue one? It's, it's, it's very, very impacting, for example, on adherence. The fact that they take 10, probably they should take less, but okay. So, what does it mean, direct relationship for us? How am I with uh, time? Ronnie? Ronnie, time? Five minutes? So I, five minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be there. So, just to give you a number, because we are generic, that's the difference. Look on the numbers. We touch, <coughs> we put products at the hands of around 180 million people every day. There's no other pharma company in the world that does that. That's because of the generic, obviously. And on a yearly basis, because these are mostly chronic, it's half a billion. Then you have obviously the addition of the acute people that come once or twice. So if we want to create relationship with 200 million, 108 million uh, people to help them improve the adherence and life situation, one thing you understand immediately, you can't do it without serious disruption in technology. You can't interact with 200 million people every day without serious changes in the way uh, this touch point is happening. So at some point, somebody goes to the pharmacy, he takes a drug, whether it's uh, an inhaler or a package or something else, and once he leaves the pharmacy, nobody knows what happens. Nobody knows if he takes the drug, People lie, they come to the doctor. Yeah, of course I took the drugs, but <laughs> they didn't, for good reasons. And this touch point between, I don't like to call it the product, between the drug and the patient, think about 200 million people, is a touch point that we think, if we can do something there, there is a big impact for the ecosystem. It's not just for the patient, it's for the doctor, and eventually maybe the poor payer who cannot bear uh, the cost anymore. And the way we think to do it is by what we call this chain link. I will run quickly now. Uh, first of all, you have to have the ability to manufacture. Guys, we manufacture 120 billion tablets per year. This is a phenomenal number. If you think about number two, they are, because of, uh, Generics, right? We are generics. Uh, but we have the biggest network, operation manufacturing network in the world, or one of the biggest. That gives us the ability and the flexibility, which is very, very important. So this is uh, the second element. As I said before, the first most important element is that we do have the largest cabinet of drugs in the world. Second one is the network. Third one. I'm the CIO, but I said nothing about technology, right? So I have to say something now about technology, otherwise. We are building, and again, if you think about a pharma company doing that five years ago, I mean, crazy, guys, make the drugs, make them high quality, low cost, and that's it. We are building a platform, with the help of Watson in this case, that will help us to hold information about patients, and when I say information about patients, guys, let's be clear. HIPAA compliant, PHI compliant, we are really, really, really careful about privacy. I mean, this is key. But if tomorrow information from patients will start come from using our products, I will give you a real example, which I don't think I will surprise you. Inhalers, we, we also produce inhalers. We are now developing a chip that will be on, on the inhaler. Every time a patient clicks, something is being sent. Uh, not just when and how, but also we try to uh, see uh, whether we can understand whether they inhale it correctly or not. So every time something like that happens, a bit of information with the consent of the patient and security and everything, which is a big thing. Now think about it. It's a big thing. 
He is flying back to this patient uh, cloud which we are building. And obviously, he's not just getting data from the patient, but he's bringing value back to the patient, which I will show in a second, right? Because people don't give you their data if they don't get something valuable back immediately. The third or fourth element is what we call smart technology. And this is one of the biggest areas where we anticipate that change is coming and must happen. We have dumb products. We, pharma, we're talking about uh, other uh, dumb products. A box, carton box usually, with something inside whether it's blisters or whatever, and it's very dumb. So no information is there with, which can say something about whether the patient took it, didn't take it, how many times he took it, and maybe we can create value. This is totally dumb. And one of the things we see, and this is critical, and this is where technology is going to be transformative, obviously with all the security element, think about somebody breaching and stealing this information, uh, this is risky, how to smartify the touch point between the pharmaceutical products, especially for chronic patients, and the patient itself. So we are investing there, working with companies, but we see these as a very important elements that can help transform. I will skip this one and go maybe to the last and try to summarize. So I, I, I want to keep this example of, uh, of uh, asthma. So uh, there is a, a patient is using an inhaler. Inhaler uh, creates information. Information comes to this patient cloud environment. Now, if we are able to analyze the data that came from him based on his history, again, with consent and everything, this is big. I mean, it's not something to take. Uh, light, and can also analyze what is the weather situation around where he lives, and analyze potentially reaction of other patients like him, and give him back a prediction, maybe to his doctor as well, that says, listen, under the information we have, there is a chance you are about to have an attack. Please take the acute medicine before you will need to admit to ER. And this is a very simplistic uh, example. Then this is something meaningful that as small as it is, has the potential to change everything. The relationship with the patient, the relationship with the ecosystem around the patient, uh, the adherence, and, and adherence, I go back to cost. Guys, cost, as you know better than me, it's here. And it's going to get worse. We have to do something to solve it. And it's just not, not just by lowering the drug cost or hospitalization cost. Some of it is fixed cost. You can't do a lot with that. It's only by changing the way uh, this value chain is working. So just to summarize, if we look on all these uh, forces that uh, I've uh, discussed before, for us as a pharma company, guys,